goes from you to Brian. To Zuko. No, it goes from me to Zuko. No, me to Brian. Brian back to me, then me to Zuko. We have to give them that order for sound, so we have to do it. It's fine. It's working. Fantastic. We had a slight technical interlude uh, because we are doing an actual live demo of actual <laughs> software, which is apparently very <coughs> difficult. So, very exciting these days. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amber Balde. Uh, I lead the Blockchain Center of Excellence at JP Morgan, um, and JPM is one of the proud founding members of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. So, you probably uh, have heard that over the past year, we released an open source platform called Quorum, uh, which is a fork of the, of the uh, Ethereum code base, but it's aimed at enterprise. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, I am joined by some wonderful colleagues here, so flanking either side of me uh, protectively at this point. We have the, uh, the Zcash team. Um, and then on this side, we have some JP Morgan folks uh, to talk about. They're from our technical team. Um, so we are going to crash through an hour of content in 30 minutes, as is pretty much my prerogative. So here we go. Um, everything you need to know about Quorum in 10 minutes. And at this point, 9 minutes and 17 seconds. Um, so the project goals of Quorum initially were we were working with all of these kind of nascent enterprise blockchain platforms or all the kind of groups were forming that were thinking about making them. And we were also being approached by lots of startups that uh, each had their own bespoke protocols. And we were thinking, um, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could use something that was already running in production uh, that was being tested constantly in a hostile environment, which we like to refer to as free security testing. Um, and which uh, basically we could just solve some of the concerns that, uh, as to why we couldn't use uh, public Ethereum for institutional use. So we um, spent some time working on a design uh, and which ultimately became uh, Quorum, which was released at the end of September of last year. Um, and since then, we've been, you know, we've seen kind of EEA come together along with, you know, there's many other code bases that are adjacent to the Ethereum world. Um, but we've been focusing expressly on supporting financial services use cases. Uh, and by that, I don't just uh, mean, um, you know, kind of public uh, cryptocurrency sorts of, of use cases. But what we're thinking about is institutional finance, corporate and investment banking, um, your traditional legacy kind of at global scale financial applications. So that's what we want to support with Quorum. And that requires data privacy. Um, Zuko will probably want to uh, assault me for conflating confidentiality with privacy over here, but um, wait, what? <laughs> no? Okay. It's fair. All right, thanks. I like that. Okay, um, so what, we, what we're trying to do with Quorum, though, is to add a data privacy component uh, to Ethereum such that you have private execution of smart contracts. So we'll talk about that in a sec. So what do you get with Quorum? Explain like I'm five, right? So you get permissioning, a privacy model, uh, performance, um, which we'll demonstrate with the Raft implementation in a sec, uh, configurable consensus. So when we released Quorum, it, had, uh, it, ha it ran with Quorum chain, so not, it's not a proof of work system. Um, it was using a voting-based con uh, consensus mechanism, which was created by F-Lab. Uh, you might be familiar with Jeff Wilkie, who was part of the core Ethereum group. Um, and now we've added an additional flavor uh, that's a raft implementation. That's a different algorithm. And that allows us to demonstrate settlement finality. So if you're outside of, of the finance world, you might not think that that's such a big deal. But if you look at uh, so, uh, anything that forks, like Bitcoin, where you basically have probabilistic settlement finality, if you go in and tell your corporate risk officer, yes, I'm like 98% sure that that definitely happened, um, they are not so pleased with that. So uh, figuring out how to create settlement finality is actually a real business requirement of one of these systems. Okay, and then as far as the licensing is uh, concerned, I just wanted to call that out, that the way that we've built Quorum, we, we, we just refer to it as Quorum, but it's actually two things. So there's Constellation, and Constellation is the privacy, let me actually just click back for a sec. So Constellation is the, the privacy engine of Quorum, and uh, so Patrick wrote pretty much all of that. 
Um, and that is its own module. It's its own repo. It's Apache licensed. The rest is hooking Constellation into uh, a geth node that's a standard Ethereum node. And those changes are released under the GPL license as everything that touches geth would be. Now, on top of that layer, you have your business logic and your applications. So all of the smart contracts, all the hooks into the year, legacy, um, anything there. Oops, I went the wrong direction. All of that stuff can be any sort of copyright you choose. Um, so what we're showing here is that there is kind of this, uh, this, this modularization concept. And um, as people are looking at building apps, uh, sometimes people ask me, you know, they're um, corporates and they say, does this mean all of my business IP is going to have to go be GPL licensed? I, I heard it's toxic. I'm very scared of this. You know, no. Um, basically, unless you're thinking about modifying the core geth client, the, the things that you're working on are not going to be touched or affected by the GPL license. And so when we talk about the Zcash edition, um, the zero knowledge security layer, piece that, we, that we're going to add in here, it's also going to be modularized in a way that we can license that differently, right? So, um, so within Quorum, we have the concept of public transactions and private transactions. Now, public transactions are visible within the permission network of Quorum. So we're talking about a permissioned group of participants. There will be many sorts of Quorum blockchains deployed. There is not one main net that everybody joins. Rather, they tend to be use case specific. Right now, we see most use cases aligning around specific asset classes or specific projects. Um, ultimately, I'm sure there will be interoperability and moving things between these sorts of chains. But they are kind of like permissioned islands right now. Uh, not sure how that's going to evolve. But my point being that when you hear public transactions, we don't mean that they're interacting with the public Ethereum blockchain. Right now, that's not possible. Uh, any sort of ether that you would create in your own quorum blockchain does not have value on the public mainnet. Um, and gas is set to free for what it's worth. Uh, but what you do get is a shared blockchain. And we think that that's really important. So it's not just a distributed ledger. This is actually a blockchain, right? So we have private smart contract execution meaning that you can indicate when you're creating your smart contract through the private four parameter um, who the other, your other counterparties are. Maybe that's, you know, you've got you, you've got your trading counterparty and your favorite regulator. That's fine. N number of parties can join. All of those participants to your smart contract are able to um, interact with and see that contract throughout its life. Every transaction, so every state change of that contract is also then a hash of that encrypted sort of payload is going to be uh, written to the main shared blockchain. Okay? So you have a public state tree and a private one. Okay? So those two things are different. And Patrick will talk a little bit more about it uh, in a minute. Just want to clarify up front the interaction with the public network, or lack thereof. So what have we seen since launch? Um, what we've seen is this ecosystem emerging completely independent of things that we are driving specifically at JP Morgan. This really isn't a JPM project. Uh, it's really meant to be an open source project. So of the things that you see up here, um, the only one that we knew about ahead of time was the Azure cloud hosting. Everything else I found out about on the internet, <laughs> so, which is pretty cool. So how many Ethereum developers are in the room? Anybody here an Ethereum developer? A good number of hands. Okay, so um, of those folks, how many of you have ever used Truffle framework? That is roughly an exactly analogous group of people. <laughs> so this is, uh, it's the most widely used development tools and testing framework for, for public Ethereum, right? So this is what was really cool to us. Truffle said, we added Quorum support by writing a blog. They had to change zero lines of code to support Quorum. And that's because we modified the geth client so minimally. Right? So when we say that we're trying to support an open source community and that we want to see this ecosystem emerge, what we mean is that um, your tool may already support Quorum. Right? So I think that the, it's, it's, it's really important that we not be too divergent from the sort of public innovation. That's where so, there's so much agility and, uh, and, and new thinking and different sorts of projects coming out of that space. I was uh, at Ethereal on Friday seeing all of this new stuff happening in, in the public Ethereum world. It's really heartening um, for the, the public project kind of arena. It, that is a disparate set of work from the set of problems that we're focusing on. But 
it just makes sense that over time, if we're going to be pulling the best sorts of developers that know the most about this sort of ecosystem, that we would be um, fostering a lot of collaboration in that space. Okay, so speaking of, here's our technical roadmap, right? Um, once again, getting approval to share what's our technical roadmap for a project is fun things to do at a bank. So uh, here it is though, it's on the slide, right? We are prevailing. Um, so what, we, what you've seen so far is called Quorum Core. Now we also released another testing framework that's called Cake Shop, uh, and uh, it's an IDE SDK. We're extracting some pieces from that back into this new middle piece that's called the Enterprise Toolkit. And um, there's gonna be a lot of unsexy work to integrate this with a whole variety of sorts of backend systems and support for you know, pretty much everything that makes something more than a command line interface of a protocol. If any of this speaks to you, feel free to get involved, right? Um, the goal here is to have people work on what their core competency is. Do you put stuff in containers for a living? Great, figure out how to containerize a deployment of Quorum. Tell us about it after you do it, fine. Um, you know, do, you, do you provide cloud hosting services? Put it in the cloud. Whatever speaks to you, see if, uh, if you're, what you're doing now supports Quorum, and if it supports public Ethereum, odds are it already supports Quorum. Congratulations, you now have an enterprise blockchain offering. Okay, so next, more community-driven en enhancements. And I'm gonna hand off to Brian here because I'm certainly going over, I don't wanna go over his time. Um, we, wanna, we want you to get involved. There's three places you can go. Uh, there's the Quorum splash, play, splash page on uh, the JP Morgan site. There's the code base on GitHub, most importantly. And then this Go Quorum org site is more of like a community-driven thing uh, that's a little faster moving. Yay, okay, here we go. All right. So to talk, about, um, to talk about Raft, we have Brian, who's from our engineering team. Um, and uh, as I mentioned already, we uh, shipped Quorum with Quorum Chain in it, and now we have Raft. Go ahead, skip one more slide forward. Um, in the future, what other consensus mechanisms might be available? This is where we're hoping EEA can drive some sort of, uh, of ex acceleration around pluggability and modularity, um, but there are lots of options. So uh, we've implemented, uh, my name's Brian, I'm an engineer working on the Quorum team. Uh, so we've implemented Raft-based consensus as an alternative to proof of work and to Quorum Chain. And this is a consensus mechanism that fits best in permission networks. Uh, and so we're using the Raft uh, consensus protocol, which has already existed for years and is typically used in distributed databases. It's well understood, it's formally proven correct, and it affords us two main benefits. One is faster, drastically faster block times. So instead of wait, waiting seconds to see if a transaction makes it into the blockchain, we're seeing blocks come in uh, every 25 milliseconds. Uh, and additionally, uh, there is a lack of forking. So you could also call this determinism or transaction finality. Uh, and we're able to achieve this because uh, we're using the RAF consensus protocol, which has this nice property that anything sent through it any messages sent through the protocol will arrive at all nodes in the same order. Um, and so using this primitive, we can uh, ensure that uh, settlement finality. And uh, if you're familiar with Byzantine fault tolerance, we're not currently using a, B a BFT raft, um, but we're interested in moving in that direction. Uh, so I'm gonna give a, a brief high-level intuition for how you can understand uh, how we're how exactly we're working the Raft consensus algorithm into Ethereum or into Quorum. Um, and so you can just imagine a, an Ethereum network where we have three nodes, nodes one, two, and three. And typically, all communication is done between these nodes on the Ethereum peer-to-peer -peer protocol. And so um, for the purposes of this explanation, we're mostly interested in transactions and blocks that are sent between these nodes on this, these, through these black lines here, the Ethereum peer-to-peer -peer protocol. And Regardless of which consensus mechanism you're using, transactions are all gonna enter uh, the blockchain the same way, where basically clients are gonna send transactions in and um, they're gonna be packaged up into a block. Um, and it, the thing that differs from each consensus mechanism to the next is how blocks are uh, entered into the, the blockchain. And so in vanilla proof of work, we have the equivalent of occasional lottery winners where uh, each of the nodes are spinning their CPUs and occasionally someone's gonna win the lottery and they get to create the next block. Uh, and as we know, this, this allows for, uh, this, uh, for forking, which is, which is uh, 
preclude settlement finality. And uh, we can compare that with Quorum Chain. So both of these are still only using the Ethereum peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocol. In Quorum Chain, instead of having occasional lottery winners, so to speak, we have predetermined block makers. And uh, these are going to, uh, these, these have a timer uh, uh, around a few seconds uh, and plus or minus some little jitter period. Um, each of these block makers are gonna try to make the next block that goes into the chain, and then we're gonna have a round of voting where each of the, the nodes in there will decide which block that was made uh, is gonna be the next into the chain. And that logic is governed by smart contracts, um, which go through the transactions you see on the, uh, the diagram here. And RAF differs in that instead of having one protocol, now we have two. And instead of sending both transactions and blocks through the Ethereum peer-to-peer -peer protocol, we're sending the blocks through Raft, uh, and we're still using uh, the existing peer-to-peer -peer for, for the transactions. And so what this gives us here is because any messages that you send through Raft uh, arrive at the, each of the nodes in the cluster in the same order, um, that, that guarantees that the blocks in the blockchain are all gonna be in the same order. So we have complete determinism, and that gives us our transaction finality. And uh, additionally, because we don't have to do a round of voting or a round of pegging the CPU between each of our blocks, we can quickly, as soon as we've made one block, just create the next one as soon as there are any transactions on hand. We, right now, we're creating these blocks every 25 milliseconds, but it's configurable, and... Um, okay, show it. Yeah, okay. And right. so I'm just gonna show a quick demo. So we, you see three panels here, and these are three panels uh, for logging output for uh, a, a, uh, a guest cluster that are all running the RAS consensus protocol. And I'm gonna send in one uh, transaction here. That transaction is gonna be sent to a node that is not the, the leader, and then it's going to be uh, forwarded to the leader. That transaction is gonna be wrapped up into a block. The block is gonna be sent out to each of the nodes in the cluster, and they're all gonna have the same state of the blockchain. So it's gonna happen quickly. And right there, uh, so we have with uh, transaction finality, that transaction is now in the blockchain. Uh, on, all of the, on all the nodes. And so now let's increase it to say 1,000 transactions per second. And just like that, um, all of those transactions are in the blockchain and it's done. Oh. That's awesome, so uh, the, the magic of the demo is its brevity. Um, <laughs> in, uh, you know, a lot of the time people are concerned about the performance and throughput of these solutions. I think in uh, permission chains, the, the problem set is, is different. Um, and so there are a lot of more options, right? And we're exploring uh, how things can move faster. So moving forward, uh, today there was a, an announcement that uh, JP Morgan has tapped the Zcash team uh, to, uh, to bring their zero knowledge security layer or zero knowledge settlement layer, um, as we're calling it, uh, to Quorum as well. So this is going to be uh, additive to the existing privacy model that we have. And uh, here to talk about it, we have CEO of Zcash, Zuko Wilcox. Hi there, I'm Zuko. I'm the CEO of the Zcash company, and um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on where the technology came from. Um, the, 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 the technology that we're announcing today, we're announcing its integration into Quorum, is uh, derived from some mathematics that cryptographers have been studying for several decades. Hit, hit, the, big, hit this... the big green button. Oh, the big there green button. Yeah, there we go. You don't have to read this, but um, only in the last, only in the last four, my mic is turning on and off. I'll just say everything twice. Only in the last four years or so has, it, has the math itself advanced to the level that it, uh, it could be practically implemented. And um, the, the underlying concept of zero knowledge proofs is a very general purpose uh, cryptographic tool that can, um, potentially be applied to prove the correctness of a, a lot of different things. It, um, uh, to put it, to try to simplify it, it a zero-knowledge proof can prove that a certain output is the correct output of a, of a bounded but otherwise arbitrary program. So 
whatever, <laughs> okay, so if that, well, the. So if, so if I had a picture, would you be able to tell if it was, had a filter? I like so, that analogy. So uh, an example of what you can do with zero knowledge proofs is um, one of the scientists affiliated with the Zcash company has uh, published a paper about how you could use a zero knowledge proof to show that a certain image is a cropped or brightened version of an original, but there is no fake stuff that's been photoshopped into it. Um, and that's the kind of thing that's never been possible before this sort of math was invented. But that's just an example to show you how the, it could broadly apply to all sorts of facts about data. But the first uh, uh, application of zero knowledge proofs to anything, as far as I'm aware so far, is Zcash. Zcash is a, a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin and Ethereum that's running live on the internet right now. And uh, in the same way that Bitcoin was sort of discovered, uh, blockchain was sort of discovered within Bitcoin, and, and then blockchain got uh, abstracted and made um, general uh, into a reusable tool. Um, similarly, what we're, what we're doing is taking the technology that's already running in the wild with Zcash and making that into a reusable tool, and we call it ZSL, the Zero Knowledge Security Layer. And we analogize it to how uh, when HTTP was new, it was a pretty cool uh, data transport protocol, but you couldn't actually use it for banking or for confidential information of any kind because it wasn't secure and it would leak your information to random parts of the internet. Uh, and so people had to invent what was then called SSL, the secure sockets layer, to add on top of HTTP to make it applicable for everything that's come since. Likewise, we say that ZSL is a security layer that can be added on top of blockchains. And um, today we're announcing the first integration of ZSL into uh, a separate blockchain, which is Quorum. And to talk to you about that is Patrick. Thank you. Okay, so what, what does this all mean for Quorum? So today in Quorum, we have a privacy model that is rooted in our philosophy that we wanted to stay very close to what a blockchain is, which means we wanted to have a privacy model that is fully decentralized. And so there's no central authority or notary that has to sign a test or validate any of the operations on the network. It's really just a question of, you wanting to transact with some other parties on the network. If you know their public key, you can do that. And as Amber mentioned, it goes in a public transaction on the blockchain, but the contents of the transaction are hidden. The only thing that goes in the public transaction is a cryptographic hash digest, essentially random data. Now, uh, currently with Constellation, the privacy module for Quorum, you can set up a subset of the network, a group for a private contract, and apply any arbitrary logic that you want between them. And as Amber mentioned, they will all apply the same transactions if they're party to them and have the same resultant state. But the question is, what if you have many separate such groups that do many different things on the network, but you still want to have a notion of being able to own something that can travel between those private contracts that not everyone on the network knows about. And that is really what the addition of ZSL to Quorum uh, will, will very powerfully and, and nicely help us solve in a way that stays true to that decentralized nature and not having to have somebody attest to something happening. So in, in the same sense that Constellation provides these cryptographic hash digests that are essentially random data, the ZSL layer provides public transactions that contain similarly random looking data that aren't hashes, but they're random and not, nothing can be inferred, inferred from them unless you have the secrets that are needed to, uh, to kind of reach into it. And so the, they're nicely synergetic in the sense that Constellation and our existing privacy model allows you to have any kind of contract uh, architecture that you have today on Ethereum, it, as Amber said, it plugs pretty cleanly into Quorum. You just have to specify who you're transacting with and pretty much everything else is the same as, as, as Ethereum. 
with ZSL, we will be able to have that logic trigger an event that causes the transfer of an asset or the settlement or, uh, of something or, or whatever, you, whatever you can imagine between all participants on the network without revealing really anything to the whole network. Uh, so that's really the magic uh, of this. Okay, so uh, to walk us through the uh, sort of business example application, go ahead, Jack, who's head of products. Yeah. So we've got these two pieces of technology. We've got Quorum, we've got ZSL. How do we get them to actually work together from a, from a practical perspective? Well, what we do is we took ZSL and we encapsulated it as a smart contract. And then we implemented that smart contract within Quorum. And we call this the contract to differentiate it from other smart contracts. And we call the private contracts that are deployed under the constellation the private contract. <laughs> um, we also added, you see there's a little blue layer with the ZSL integration. We added a module to the Quorum client, which uh, allows it to verify uh, ZK snark proofs, which is what ZSL relies on. And these, these Z contracts, the, there will be, the, the, the model is that there will be one for each type of asset. There will be an issuer who will create it. It's permissionlessly created. Um, so you can imagine there'll be Z contracts for dollars, there'll be Z contracts for equities, any kind of digitized and tokenized asset, there'll be a separate Z contract for it. That means that you can have business logic within a private contract in Constellation, which is what Quorum had previously, and then the settlement piece is enabled by the Z contract. And let's look at a, a use case example. Let's say that Alice wants to buy some cat shares and Bob wants to sell some. You've got uh, Z contracts for US dollars and, and the cat shares. What they can do is Alice can create a private contract which defines the terms of that trade. She can propose it to Bob and then Bob can accept it. So there we've got a state of the private contract and it's accepted. Then Alice can make the payment of dollars from the Z contract or within the Z contract to Bob. The contract, the private contract is capable of recognizing that that has been made. So you'll see that its state is updated to paid. And then Bob can make delivery of the shares to Alice. And the private contract will recognize that those shares have been delivered. And ultimately, it'll settle the trade. And at the end of the day, everything has happened privately. The rest of the participants in that shared ledger, that, that shared blockchain, have no idea um, who was trading, how much was being traded, or who the <coughs> participants were. And this isn't just applicable vanilla equity trades. What we're talking about here is a, is, is, a, is a smart contract implemented privately. So any sort of business logic can be implemented within the smart contract. So not just a vanilla equity trade, you could have interest rate swaps, you could have credit default swaps, options, futures, forwards, uh, currency swaps, swaptions. Okay, we can settle all the things. Okay. okay. <laughs> I just thought, you know, it'd be interesting. Okay. Give me the clicker back. <laughs> Okay, so, so to take it back to a high level and wrap up here, uh, and I'm not, I maybe we'll be able to take one question if there's time, uh, is really what we're talking about is a, a settlement only sort of layer that is the true transfer of ownership. But within the sort of financial assets that we're looking at, there is a ton of work that happens behind the scenes before you get to a final settlement. So all of the sorts of affirmations, confirmations, allocations, all of the Asians that have to happen uh, to make these sorts of, of, um, of asset market kind of value chains complete happen within the traditional smart contracts that we have that are already facilitated by Constellation. You only need to call out to the sort of settlement layer when there's a final actual handoff of that asset, right? And so there have been some sort of, you know, the performance of the, the ZSL layer is slower, but that is vastly mitigated by the fact that you're not calling it, if, like if we were to put the ZSL layer on top of public Ethereum, if every EVM call had to go through the ZSL, it would be incredibly uh, taxing, right? So we're taking kind of the strength of each of the systems, and they're actually complementary to each other when applied within a permission network. And on top of that, we could use this to enhance the sort of regulatory compliance that we're looking to do, whereas we can say that, you know, 100 tokens to represent some security were issued. And let's say that from the, you know, the smart contracts that have the, the application layer enforces that you need to send these, the reports of your trades to your regulator. 
Well, how does the regulator verify that? Now, with the settlement layer, the regulator would be able to call back and say, let me check how many tokens I can still see. I only see 90 of 100. Where are those other 10? There's no backdoor to figure out where those 10 are. This is a truly distributed system. But what you can do, are they actually cutting my lights off? <laughs> uh, but what you can do is use the traditional legal system then, or our financial system to figure out where your tokens are. So that ends. Yay. Yay. Good job.